This is the Financially Simple Podcast, the show dedicated to destroying the complexities of money for today's small business owner. The content in the show is for informational purposes only. This show is not investment advice. Instead, seek help from a competent financial advisor or conduct your own due diligence. Justin Goodbread, CFP, is an investment advisor representative of Heritage Investors, a registered investment advisor only conducting business in states where it is properly registered or is excluded or exempted from registration requirements. Registration is not an endorsement of the firm by securities regulators and does not mean the advisor has achieved a specific level of skill or ability. Here's your host, pizza-loving, certified financial planner, Justin Goodbread. And welcome back to the Financially Simple Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Goodbrand. Today, we're going to continue with our deep dive into risk management for us business owners. And we're looking at the personal side of finances. In our last episode, we talked about the legal documents. And I want to continue with that theme and deal with trust. Today, I want to cover the nine basic types of trust. You're like, Justin, seriously. Yeah, we're going to dig into the weeds a little bit over this episode and the next one for sure. But I want you to have some basic concepts, some basic foundation in how trust work. You're going to recognize many of these names that we use today because throughout the podcast series, now some 183 episodes now, we have used these words almost as if you 100% know what they mean. We've had guests on the show who've used these words, and I've had to clarify them at that particular time to explain it. Well, now it's the time to lay the baseline on what the basic trusts are. Next episode, we're going to deal with the specific trusts that are used, but today we're going to just cover the categories, if you will, the silos, the divisions, the areas to which trusts are often utilized. So let's start by what is a trust? Well, a trust is a legal document that is created during a person's lifetime and often survives many times, survives the person's life or their death. It continues to live on after the fact. It can be created as a standalone document, which so many do. In fact, I have a trust that's created as a standalone document, or it can be created by a will. We talked about a testamentary trust in our last few episodes, and so it's created by the will. So once assets are placed into a trust, it is considered funded. If assets are never placed in a trust, it's considered unfunded. Now, whenever you have a trust, typically there's going to be a trustee. That's the person whose job is to oversee the rules and the instructions of the contract or the document. And typically the trust is there for a beneficiary or there's a relationship to where the trustee has a fiduciary responsibility to care for the proceeds or the assets of the beneficiary, those who ultimately receive the trust assets. So it's relatively simple. It's relatively a simple concept, meaning that we want to place assets somewhere that can be utilized after our death for the benefit of somebody else. That's the simplest way I can define a trust. So there are nine basic categories of trust. Some of these are pretty popular. In fact, I was looking through these nine categories, and I believe at one point or another within the Financially Simple podcast series that I have mentioned or guests have mentioned these nine categories at some point. So today I want to go over these nine basic categories. In the next episode, I want to deal with the types of trust there are. And you're going to be amazed at all the different ways that the IRS and the law allows us to work within the rules to protect the assets or minimize taxes. So let's start with the easy one, and that's called a revocable trust. A revocable trust is created during the lifetime of the trust maker the person who's creating the trust. And the key thing about a revocable trust is it can be altered. It can be changed. It can be modified. It can have adjustments made to it that's modified. Duh. But ultimately, it can be revoked. It can be terminated. It can be annulled. Perhaps the most popular form of a revocable trust is called a living trust. Sometimes these names are used interchangeable. You may hear friends say, hey, I've had living trust or I have a revocable trust. They're typically used interchangeably. And the idea being that you can place a title of an asset within this trust. And as long as it's there, it will help the owner transfer the assets from one to another. And the assets that are owned by the trust are not subject to probate. In other words, the court doesn't have to know about it. Whenever there's a, someone who dies, you don't have to put a notice in the newspaper about the assets they have, depending on the state, by the way, that you're in. So a revocable trust is one that you create while you're alive and you can terminate it or change it while you're alive. Now, whenever you pass away, whatever the trust says becomes the rule. And the trustee at that point has to follow the wishes of the trust. Now, opposite 
of a revocable trust is perhaps the number two most popular style trust. It's called an irrevocable trust. And there are many types of irrevocable trust, but in concept, it's the opposite of revocable. You cannot, and I repeat, you cannot alter it. You can't change it. You can't modify it. And you certainly can't revoke it or get rid of it or annul it or terminate the trust. You just can't. Once the trust maker places an asset within the trust and it's signed, whatever asset is in that trust is there to stay. It cannot be moved. Perhaps the most popular, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how this works, is what's called a life insurance trust or an islet, irrevocable life insurance trust. I personally have one of those. Whenever I purchase a life insurance, I place the money into a trust, and if something happens to me, the trust gets the proceeds tax-free, just like it were part of my estate, and the trustee now has to determine where those assets go. We're going to talk about that a little bit more next episode. So the difference between the first two categories is relatively simple. A revocable trust, you can change And an irrevocable trust, you can't change. That's the easiest definition I can give you. Now, there's a few more types of trust that are used for various reasons. The third most popular, and I'm not saying this in a popularity contest, I'm talking about the frequency that of which I hear them personally. The third most popular is called an asset protection trust, an asset protection trust. Now, the state in which you live is going to govern the rules of this trust. By the way, every trust, because they're state mandated, the states have to be specific. Some states allow certain things and some states don't. But an asset protection trust is there to do exactly what it sounds, to protect your assets. The idea being this is we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Just because we're successful in our business, so to speak, doesn't mean we're always going to be successful in our business. What happens if Your business reaches hardship and the funds or the assets that you have that you own were to suddenly be subjected to a creditor. Well, if your assets that which you own were placed into an asset protection trust and within the right parameters, et cetera, then regardless of what the creditors do, the assets are insulated or protected or there's a layer of division between your personal assets and what's in the trust. Perhaps the most common way I've seen an asset protection trust is used in lieu of or in replacement of a prenup, a prenuptial agreement. And as you may recognize, that term a prenuptial agreement is often utilized whenever you have individuals who are getting married for whatever reason, obviously because they love each other, but one person may have more assets, more income, or more et cetera than the other. And the concern being that this individual a gold digger. And that's the term that we would hear if we were listening to media is this individual is a gold digger. In fact, recently I have a client who's a very successful medical doctor, very successful. We've been working together now some seven, eight years and the client was concerned. I wouldn't say concerned. They were questioning whether or not they should have a prenuptial agreement and knowing the positives and negatives, which would obviously ensue with a prenuptial agreement in many cases, This individual was not a fan of that, nor was I in this particular case, nor their parents, by the way, which mattered the most. At least my opinion mattered because daddy loves his daughter. One of the things we could have done is we could place the assets to which my client currently owns into an asset protection trust. And should a divorce ever come about, the assets would be protected not only from creditors, but from the spouse at that particular point because of the way the Tennessee law allows us to do things. So an asset protection trust is there to protect assets. That's the third type of trust. The fourth type of trust is what's called a charitable trust, a charitable trust. And there are many, there are many charitable trusts. The idea being is that you're going to give money to the trust and it's going to benefit a charity. And you're like, Justin, why would you do that? Well, we use it for a number of things. We use it as a great planning tool that can help minimize taxes. In fact, I spoke about this in one of our podcasts, to which we'll link when we place this particular episode on the blog. We have a podcast out there where I actually give a real-life example. One of our clients selling a business for $10 million decided to give 10% of it, so a million dollars, to a charity. And by doing so, they ended up netting more money in sales proceeds than had they not given the money to the charity at all. So a charitable trust is a way that you can help reduce your income taxes. And we're going to talk about a number of charitable trusts in our next episode. You're listening to the Financially Simple Podcast. Show your support by subscribing to this and our other educational business channels at FinanciallySimple.com. Now, the fifth major type of trust is what's called a constructive trust. And it's an implied trust. Typically, it's created by the court. 
and it's determined from certain facts or circumstances. So the court may decide that even though there was never a really a trust document in place, that it was the intention of the individual to actually have this as part of a trust. So typically language will get involved in this or poorly drafted in a jurisdiction type of language will bring a constructive trust into place. It's not one that I would worry about, but we're going to talk about it a little bit next time. So I need to kind of outline that there's a constructive trust. And the simple definition for a constructive trust is it's one that is implied. It's one that typically a court establishes based on the facts and the circumstances of the overarching case. And the court may say, hey, this individual was really trying to create a trust and the language is not there. So we're going to impose a trust. That's what a constructive trust is. And friends, again, I guess it goes without saying, but I want to clarify, especially as we get into some of these details. And I'm not giving you legal advice. That's not the job here. I'm not giving you tax advice. I'm just basically providing some educational information for you. And, And honestly, I'm trying to take very complex strategies or complex things and break them down simply so that we understand them. And whenever you break things down simply, as I just did with a constructive trust, you lose a lot in translation. I'm just telling you that. This is why I constantly say, to friends, you've got to hire a razor sharp attorney as part of your planning team. You do need a good certified financial planner. You do. You need a good business planner. You need a really good CPA and you need a really good attorney because all of them work together. So let's go on to the next trust. Now, we talked about this. Whenever we talked about, should you hire your special needs children? What do you do with your special needs children? And we delve into briefly a special needs trust. We talked about the various ways you can establish it. The idea being that if we can set up a trust for a person who receives a government benefit, that we can try to not disqualify them from government benefits by using a proper trust. And we can allow the individual to fully utilize social security and all of its benefits that often people with special needs or disabilities are eligible to use. So I'm not going to dive into extreme detail on a special needs trust, but that is another category of trust. And we've already spent time talking about this and we'll talk a little bit about it in the next episode. Now, number seven is called a spendthrift trust, a spendthrift trust. Now, the idea being is that you're going to establish a trust for a beneficiary, which does not allow the beneficiary to sell or pledge. And that's the key right there, the pledge, the interest of the trust. So oftentimes what will happen is if somebody will say, yes, I'm a beneficiary of a trust and they'll go do something. They'll say, hey, I will pledge my income or my distributions from this trust for something else. Well, spendthrift is protected from the beneficiary's creditors. The creditors can't stick their hands in and say, well, you promised you would give us this information or this income or this asset as a collateral piece. A spendthrift trust prevents that from happening. In my financially simple terms, I'm going to tell you this. If you have a child (laughs) who loves to spend money or maybe is going through a hard time, I actually have a client of mine whose son is in rehab because of addictions and some abuse of substances. So we're actually considering using a spendthrift trust provision and some estate trust that we're going to talk about as part of a way to protect the child from money. Man, I've seen money destroy families. And I got to tell you, I've yet to meet a business owner, yet to meet a business owner. I hope I never do because I probably won't work with this individual. But I've yet to meet a business owner that doesn't place their family above their wealth. Never seen it. I know it's out there. I know we see the Hollywood movies, but I've never seen one. And honestly, I probably wouldn't work with somebody who places money above their family. Just wouldn't work. It's not my ethos, not the way I believe. And I'm dealing with this right now in a real life situation where a business owner is really concerned. The husband and wife are really concerned that the money will pass to the beneficiaries and thus create even more addiction issues. So a spendthrift trust allows us to deal with that. Now, another type of trust is called a tax bypass trust. Typically, it's called an AB trust, but what it does, it allows one spouse to leave proceeds to the other, thus limiting estate taxes. So we're going to talk about the AB trust, but in a nutshell, it's its own type of trust, and there's many different classes of trust that fit into this category, but it's called a tax bypass trust. The idea being is that you're trying to minimize taxes on the assets that you're shifting from one to the other. So that's a tax bypass trust. And finally, number nine, this is what's called a Totten 
Trust. Now, I mentioned this in our last few episodes. A Taunton Trust is one that's created during the lifetime of the grantor, the person creating the trust, by depositing money into an account, a financial institution's account, in his or her name as the trustee for another. We talked about as a special needs trust that you can actually create a trust for somebody else. That could be somewhat considered a Totten Trust. The idea being that it's a revocable trust, which the gift is not complete. It's not complete until the grantor dies. The person creating the trust or the trust maker, depending on which term you want me to use, whenever they die, the gift is now complete. So oftentimes we'll see this with very high net worth individuals who are trying to minimize their estate size. They'll create an account in somebody else's name. Then they will add their name as the trustee for the benefit of somebody else. And they'll deposit assets in that. And whenever they pass away at that point, the money shift from their estate to the other and it's outside the estate. It's outside the grantor, the person who just passed away, the trust maker's estate. So there are nine different ways you can transfer money. We can use a revocable trust, which means you can adjust it. We can use an irrevocable trust, which means once we place the assets in there, it's done. We can use an asset protection style trust, which means once we put the assets in the style trust, it's protected from creditors. We can use a charitable trust, which, by the way, is one of my favorites. In other words, you're giving money to a charity, but you get a huge benefit from that donation. I believe that we should give. I really do. There is a constructive trust, which is typically the court's going to come in and say, hey, this is what it was really meant. There's a special needs trust. If you have somebody or know somebody who has somebody in their family who's special needs, this is a way that you can protect assets and help minimize the income, thus maximizing Social Security benefits. There's a spendthrift trust, which is we talked about somebody in your family is not really good with money. You may use a spendthrift provision or trust created just for that particular use. There's the tax bypass trust, the type of trust that we can place money in, thus trying to minimize either estate or income taxes. And finally, there's the Totten Trust. The Totten Trust, typically a bank account, could be a brokerage account that you're setting up for somebody else for their benefit. And that's typically going to be like a POD, paid upon death, TOD, transfer upon death. There's an IFF. There's an ATF. There's all sorts of little names that you can put on a Totten Trust. But the idea being that we're creating it for somebody else. And when we pass away, it goes to them. So I've just given you nine key categories that all trusts that we're going to talk about next episode fall into. So the nine key categories. Phew. Feel like you're in a class, don't you? Me too. This next episode is going to be deep in the weeds. I think you're going to enjoy it. You might learn something. And I hope to challenge your thinking a little bit. This is the foundation of step number one. Next time, we're going to talk about those key trusts and how they fit into this. And we're going to sell through them super fast just to give you an idea on what's out there. And the reason why, more importantly, you need a good planner. Look, if you don't have a good planner... You don't have a good attorney. You need some help with your personal finances or your business finances. Our team is ready to help. We are excited. We have our team is growing. We have planners and we have consultants and we have, man, we have more credentials in this office than you can shake a stick out of just professionals who know how to help you increase your revenue, increase your net worth, drive you to your goals. With that, I'm going to say life is hard. It is. Life is good. Legal documents can be frustrating. You're just starting to see the legal side of things. It doesn't have to be, folks. Money doesn't have to be complicated or frustrating. Let's continue to make our lives at least financially simple. Hey, y'all go out and make it a great day. You've been listening to the Financially Simple Podcast. For more business and personal financial help and information, head over to FinanciallySimple.com today.